So recently, I think around the world, people noticed that Taiwan uh, is the first country in Asia past the same-sex marriage um, in 2019. And also we passed the co-adoption rights between same-sex um, spouse, and, but still other things uh, we are working on that. Right now, we haven't achieved equality. So that means there are still um, some gaps between heterosexual couples and same-sex couples uh, the, the early this year. Before the Lunar New Year, um, the government um, issued an uh, administration orders to uh, legalize transnational marriage, which means um, um, er, if you are uh, with your same-sex partners and you are the foreigner in Taiwan, um, right now you will be able to get married with your same-sex partner in Taiwan. So um, besides people from China, because that under the other regulations. So, so they, they are very supportive, but they also face a lot of pressure from the um, Chinese government, the representative in at the UN to push them not to invite activists from Taiwan. And so uh, welcome friends to another episode of Gender Equality Talks. Today we have a very special guest amongst us from Taiwan, Jennifer Liu. So welcome Jennifer, how are you? Hello everybody, I'm Jennifer Liu. I'm from Taiwan right now. I'm the director for Asia program at Outright International. Right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Jennifer, especially for, you know, uh, dedicating uh, so many years, all 20 years nationally and internationally on LGBT yeah. rights and uh, political reform movements. She's a social worker, lesbian, feminist, author, and Taiwanese. And before joining Outright, Jennifer was executive director of Taiwan Equality Campaign, known as Marriage Equality Coalition Taiwan, a leading organization that pushed marriage equality in Taiwan. So, uh, so thanks a lot, Jennifer, for joining us. Please let us know uh, how the highlights of Taiwan's progress on gender equality and human rights for gender diverse people, including LGBTQIA plus people. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me again. And I'm very excited to share uh, Taiwan's stories. Um, I, I have been working in Taiwan's LGBT movement for over 20 years. So recently, I think around the world, people noticed that Taiwan uh, is the first country in Asia past the same-sex marriage um, in 2019. So it's already four years past. So still right now, we are the only one. And so Nepal, we know, um, uh, they are also going uh, through a process that uh, the civil society right now have the uh, Supreme Court's uh, decision and to push the government to move it forward, right? So, but the Taiwan, we passed the law uh, in 2019, so attract a lot of attention. And right now we can see many, many um, interesting changes recently. Um, the reason I said same-sex same marriage is because um, right now we haven't achieved equality. So that means there are still um, some gaps between heterosexual couples and same-sex couples. Um, but the government and the civil society is still working on that based on a lot of research campaign and advocacy work. Um, for example, recently, um, I think around a few months ago, the government, uh, the, the early this year, before the Lunar New Year, um, the government um, issued an uh, administration orders to uh, legalize transnational marriage, which means um, um, er, if you are uh, with your same-sex partners and you are the foreigner in Taiwan, um, right now you will be able to get married with your same-sex partner in Taiwan. So um, besides people from China, because that under the other regulations. So um, because we have some special issues between Taiwan and China, I believe everybody knows that. But um, besides China, uh, everyone around the, the world. You can get married with a Taiwanese in Taiwan, which was not allowed 
um, in the beginning, like three years um, when we passed the laws. And also we passed the co-adoption rights between sex-sex um, spouse, and, but still other things uh, we are working on that. Thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. This is really very uh, important for all of us to hear about the same-sex uh, marriage laws in Taiwan, as well as uh, co-adoption rights for same-sex couples. In India, it's a very uh, contentious issue currently. And um, um, and let us hope that uh, uh, progressive laws can uh, can happen. Uh, so what more needs to happen? Yeah, over to you. Yeah, so right now, I think people, especially um, the same-sex couples, they want their own kids. They cannot use alternative reproduction technology in Taiwan. And, and one of the realities is Taiwan, we do have the lowest the birth rates around the world. I know in India, you see, people are still quite willing to ha have babies. But in Taiwan, I think every couples only have like 0 0.8 kids. So that means we have very, very low birth rate. So, and also we have very strict uh, alternative reproduction uh, law. So, um, but um, a lot of uh, same-sex couples, I, I think it's still a part of our traditional culture that after you get married, you want to form your own family. And so a lot of same-sex couples right now um, Probably they have some family pressures to push them have their own kids. So, um, but it's it's for us it's an equality issue, right? So because the heterosexual couple they have a lot of resources, and also at the same time, um, the governments wants to increase our birth rate, so they provide a sponsor allowance for the straight couple to. Uh, have their own kids. The financial support is really like uh, a lot. Um, but for the hit, uh, for same-sex couples, they need to fly to other countries, spend more money, and uh, going through like unfamiliar in uh, medical environments, and uh, uh, the language is not like uh, our uh, our own like a uh, uh, first language. It's still a lot of difficulties at this moment, and also at the same time, I would say in the, our bureau bureaucracy and the um, governmental system, there are still a lot of um, issues. Um, for example, like the frontline officers, they are not really, especially in the smaller county and the, the rural areas, they probably don't have a lot of opportunity to know uh, like a real LGBT people. So that means when they face one or two in their uh, the lifetime, um, um, they they usually don't know how to respond them properly, and uh, how can we train the officers and uh, government officials to use gender neutral terminology, and then make them understand what is the um, gender equality issues. I think that is also one of the challenges our government um, is having right now. Also for the transgender issues um, in Taiwan, we still need to um, have, um, we call compulsory surgery. If one transgender wants to change their own ID card, so that means you cannot have your own baby, relate to baby again. <laughs> so you cannot have your own baby because you need to um, uh, do the surgery and to change your ID card. So we are allowed to uh, change your ID card, but you need to, um, we, we have a very weird policy. You need to have your parents' signature. Even, <laughs> even you are like, 50 years old or 60 years old. So that create a kind of obstacles for the transgender individuals. Sometimes um, they, they probably, because of their gender identity, they don't have really good relationship with their parents. And this is not from the law. It's not from the policy. It's because the hospital don't want to be sued by their parents, because when they change the, their, um, uh, like a, a trend, do the surgery, change their gender, 
they the, the hospital worry about all oh, their parents might be upset and sue them so <laughs> this is a very weird situation because that um that um shows that um the whole society still see a, a, a people even they are adult under their parents control so i uh, i still um, probably people feel like oh taiwan is very progressive but we still have a lot of traditional culture um, and relate to our law and policy so that's um, um, needs a lot of discussion and debates right now in taiwan thanks jennifer oh, very very important again for all of us to learn um, you know the challenges which still exist and the, despite these challenges the work which is progressing ahead uh, so jennifer uh, um, so, uh, will you mind uh, sharing uh, you know when you look back 20 years is a very long time so to like for 20 years you have uh, uh, you know dedicated the uh, worked on uh, advancing gender rights as well as uh, you know uh, the freedom so um, um, and as, as far as i understand uh, there's a lot more work needs to be done at the un level right like when it comes to Taiwan, and I hope Taiwan and uh, several other uh, nations which uh, get due recognition, and just like Palestine, for instance, and mm -hmm. um, um, uh, we totally support that. So, so we, what message do you have for other activists and advocates around the world, and especially, you know, when uh, it, it's a quite a long tenure, and you have, and it has really yielded very positive results. When we say Taiwan has progressive laws. It's so good, but a lot of effort and work has gone into it. It must have been, um, I presume it must have been very challenging. So over to you to hear some highlights from that journey. Back to you. Yeah, and this is a very good question. Um, um, when I start to work international, regionally and internationally, Taiwan's nationality issues become one of the like um, very into important topic I had and have till right now. For example, I cannot enter the UN building by my passport. And even as uh, I'm not from the government, I'm from civil society, I'm an NGO worker, I'm an activist. And also I represent Asia, but even just want to participate in an event or an pa a panel related to LGBT or gender equality issues, I cannot um, use my passport to enter the UN building. Of course, we have as uh, you know, the global citizen, I really want to use the, the, the way like everybody else. And so I, I believe a lot of people don't really understand the reality. And also um, after uh, I joining the, like uh, some regional and international organization, for example, like outright, um, when, before I joined as the uh, full-time staff, I was the local activist uh, working with outright for many years. So they, they are very supportive, but they also face a lot of pressure from the um, Chinese government, the representative in, at the UN to, push them not to invite activists from Taiwan. And um, at the same time, I feel like um, as a Taiwanese activist, we, uh, we really lack the experience and the connection between um, this country and uh, everybody else around the world <laughs> because we cannot participate any kind of in international occasions. So that means I don't understand at all when I start to uh, work in those occasions, the, the, the international organizations, I, I had no, I had no clue. I had no knowledge. And then because I have, we, we don't have like a, like a senior uh, activist to show us how to like uh, do the work. So um, also, especially the funding, of course, Taiwan, um, people probably see as uh, one of the developed countries in Asia, like uh, Japan and South Korea. But I, I think it's, um, it's a very interesting situation in this region because um, usually we call, so in, in Western countries, usually your economic developed status relate to your democratic 
uh, level and also uh, relate to your, like uh, we say, uh, progressive levels. <laughs> However, um, in this region, in, in Asia, we see some countries like South Korea, Japan, and or Singapore, they have very advanced economic situation, but um, for the civil society, especially relate to gender equality, um, it's, it's quite far from the standards. So, uh, so, um, but uh, take Taiwan as a, another example that we we never received any international funding, even like a uh, twenty thirty years old when we uh, years uh, years ago when we were still in the developing levels. Um, because of the international status, we, we cannot receive any uh, international funding. But that is that's also one, I, I feel like is also some positive uh, impact. For example, um, at some point, the, some international fundings, they all have their, um, their goal, their strategies, and then they have their focuses uh, in the early 90s. A lot of international human rights funding focus on HIV preventions. So you can see a lot of HIV prevention NGOs grow up quickly because of the international fundings. But because in Taiwan, we don't have any international funding, we basically grow up by our own and we decide what we want. We didn't, um, we, we, we don't, we, we are not impacted by those international fundings um, direction. So I would say that that is also good positive impact because we actually grow up really underground and we can uh, make our own decisions. So this is pros and cons, I think. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, uh, Jennifer. This is uh, really interesting because um, uh, I think it was last month when we were speaking with Hua from transgender rights activist from uh, Thailand and who has, uh, as you may be aware of already. So she was saying that uh, serve people what they need mm. and yes. not that what donors want, not about yeah. the donors indicators and uh, no, which may not necessarily match what people's need. So thanks a lot for, so, uh, for saying oh, that. Dear. So before we wrap up, is there anything else which you would like to share with us? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So right now I'm also switch, switching uh, my position to a more regional and international ones. Um, as a very long term activist, I realized that in Asia, uh, we really need to work together um, to make sure we are sending the correct message to, like you said, to the international founders, to um, they them understands um, because right now um, the the international LGBT fundings around the world um, only five percent in dedicate in the region in Asia, but we have more than sixty percent population and worldwide. So that means Asian um, Asian activists and Asian issues really, 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 really uh, under representation. So I'm I'm really hoping that um, anyone are interesting in move like uh, do more this kind of regional international work. We can work together hand in hand to make sure that we are sending the message that um, we are not need your help, but we need you need the funder work with us together. So I think this is different power dynamic. And I believe Asia uh, will be the future and we have to do more as the LGBT activist because right now uh, a lot of um, governments uh, like tend to more conservative and think LGBT issues is like a Western force try to intervene our national policies so our voices is really matter thank you absolutely your voices do matter and our voices do matter so thanks a lot for saying that again let us hope that people remain central um, you know as governments advance um, the development agenda and development ag agenda is not driven by corporations or others but uh, is socially just for everyone
So, uh, yeah. so thanks a lot, Jennifer, for joining us today. Friends, we were listening to Jennifer Lu. She's director of Asia Programs at Outright uh, International and uh, has spent over 20 years in uh, you know gender justice movement for LGBT communities, but also political reforms movement. Earlier, uh, before joining Outright, I mean, you know, like she was the executive director of Taiwan Equality Campaign, which is now known as Marriage Equality Campaign Taiwan, and a uh, leading organization that pushes marriage equality in Taiwan that is hope um, the, the you know the good work which has happened in Taiwan also inspires and stimulates more such positive action for gender, towards gender equality in other nations and communities. So thanks a lot, Jennifer. All power to you. All the Thank best you. wishes, and um, uh, and we hope to hear from you at some other point soon. Thanks. Take care. Thank bye bye. You. Safe travels. You too. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.